So I'm behind my shop. It's getting late in the evening, sun's going down. My forge is heating up. I've got the big propane forge burning, warming up, coming up to temperature for a project I'm gonna work on for a while tonight. And I thought, heck, I'll just step out back and answer a few questions. We've jotted down a few of the really good questions you guys have posed in the comments on the channel over the last couple of months. Rob Lucier or Lucier, it took him longer to clean up than the job did. Nice move. Okay, my boy printed these, and that's not a question, is it? That's an assertion. But it brings up a valid point, and sometimes there are jobs where the mobilization, the rollout, the roll up, the get back to the shop takes longer than the work. You've got to charge for all of it. Don't make the mistake of thinking you should only be charging or attaching value to the time you spend on the task. Everything that contributes to accomplishing the work is part of the job. Yeah. Next question is a great question from M. Cal. Why not just forge one yourself? And you're talking M. Cal about anvils. This was in, a, in a conjunction with an anvil video. So the short answer is, brother, it's hard to forge an anvil. It takes very specialized, big tooling. My forge would about do it for a smallish anvil. My power hammer doesn't open up far enough to be able to strike the blows that would be needed. But I was in a shop today that had a power hammer that would do it. Man, if I ever had something like that, I would be tempted. So stand by. You never know what I might try to do, but right now, don't have the equipment, and I have other things to make. Thanks for the question, though. The third one, from Technicolor 3, retire. So my back and my knees and my shoulder agree with you 100% Technicolor 3 one, <laughs> but I've just got to say that the economic reality of being a contractor post-2009 recession doesn't make retirement a viable option. 59 years old, Social Security, if it was enough, and if it still exists in six years, is not gonna do it either. And so frankly, I'm building a YouTube channel. The next question from William Nelson. Why is YouTube pushing Anvil videos on me? Just lucky, I guess, William. <laughs> from Looney Lizard. Great vid. You're not a fan of hearing protection? I guess for the hammering, you'd need to be able to hear different tones, but for grinding, would you not be better off with ear defenders? So, Looney Lizard, first of all, thanks for the compliment. And you're right, okay? You're right. Hearing is something to be protected. Ears are also something to be used. Now, I don't know if there's any truth to what I'm about to tell you, but I do know this. I knew, know that about a year and a half ago, my hearing started kind of being bad. I thought, man, I can't hear. Is it finally caught up with me? And I went to the doctor and he pulled, he said, the biggest wad of earwax out of my ears that he'd ever seen. I think I've had for a long time natural hearing protection, but I intend, and you can remind me if you want, to be a little better about hearing protection. There's no reason not to wear earplugs. I can't wear earmuffs, they get in the way, they get knocked off, but you're right, okay, ear defenders are worthwhile. So just a little more, Looney Lizard, and for the rest of you, I know you won't hesitate to call me out, but don't hesitate to call me out. If you see me doing something that appears to be unsafe, because I can see that there's a lot of people watching these things and I don't want to be a bad example, but on the other hand, I'm not a safety sally, and I may not take your advice, but I might, because I do have some habits that I've learned that have been reinforced, that I have accommodated in my work routine that are not ideally safe. So don't hesitate to voice your opinion on this. I may adopt a different approach, I may not, but I need to hear it. And besides that, the other people that read the comments need to be aware that just because they see me do something doesn't mean they should. Thanks. So the next question actually is another assertion. Way to go, Nate. We're looking for questions here, actually. but. It goes like this, and it's from Matt Gallington. As a builder and safety professional, I seriously doubt this would fly with OSHA. Cool trick, but would hate to see some applications less experienced folks might try this on. Two things. One of the messages of my channel is, the most important tool you have, the most important tool I have, and the tool that frankly I am hoping to improve in your shop, is your brain. It's my brain. That's the only safety tool that counts. But, pause comma, you're right. It could be that someone would see this and would try some sort of an leverage arrangement and not keep track of the fact that the beam end was gonna be free when it came up off the load and the thing goes sideways and, and, and. So Matt, you're right, thank you. One of the things I'm most thankful for is that I never, never, never have to deal with OSHA as a general contractor where I am most of the time the sole employee. <laughs> okay. Okay. From Dan Simmons. 
he's the fastest cleaner upper I've ever seen. Must have been a mechanical engineer at some point. <laughs> so there might be some inside professional joke between the mechanical engineers on this in this question about cleaning up messes. Okay, engineers do that, so do carpenters. In fact, let me tell you this, the key to being a good carpenter lies not in never making mistakes, but rather in being able to cover them up quickly. Now, I hope that doesn't offend any of you, but it is true, isn't it? So the fast cleanup, we probably need to develop some kind of an icon that shows up on the screen when, when my boy is editing this in a, in a two times speed or a four times speed mode. As a young man, it might have been possible to suspect that was real time footage, but not anymore. I'm, I'm slowed down to what to me feels to be a snail's pace, probably is an average sort of production or non-production, an average sort of residential carpenter pace. The miracle of modern media editing makes me look young again. From C. Wayne 4, what kind of pants do you wear? Love your vids. Thanks for the compliment, man. <coughs> pants, that is an easy question that I'm happy to answer. For the past, so I moved back to Oregon in 1994, went right to work logging with my dad, bought in with him, and then stepped out of that after two or three years back into construction when I saw logging was not viable. I had discovered Carhartt double front logger dungaree fit. They are the only work pant as far as I'm concerned. But the key thing is, they're the only work pant because of the way they're constructed, because of the orientation of the pockets. The double panel in the front provides protection. The bachelor buttons from the factory mean real suspenders will attach and never come off. That's the pant I wear. I used to burn through the front layer. I had it seemed like about two months I would start having show, holes show up in the front layer, but then I had another pair of pants underneath, so I'd get another two or three months out of them. I never wear the front panels out anymore. They just sort of gradually turn gray like the rest of us until I have to get a new blue pair. But they're great pants. I highly recommend them. Okay, next question. Christopher Murphy, what kind of suspenders do you wear? I've never worn them before thinking about trying some. I don't know what the brand is on these, but they're a loggers variety because they attach to bachelor buttons never make the mistake of buying a pair of clip-on suspenders for work pants. You're going to be disappointed every day. Once you wear suspenders that are properly attached and properly fit, you're never going to go back. All right. So the question from Rick Green is around asking me whether I ever met Larry Hahn, the author of Larry Hahn, The Very Efficient Carpenter. He retired to Coos Bay, which is really only about 60 miles from where I'm sitting right now. No, Rick, sorry, I didn't get to meet him. And I've never read the book, my bad. But I've worked with several guys who have, and they had some tricks that came from that book that were revelatory to me and led me to a lot of other techniques because of the approach I could see sort of in the foundation of that method. Larry Hahn was a giant. He revolutionized modern production framing techniques. I wish I would have met him. <laughs> from Vehicle Virgins. Love the channel, man. You remind me of Ralphie from A Christmas Story Grown Up. So I'd be lying if I didn't confess to you right now that there were a couple guys in Las Vegas, I worked on a big high production commercial concrete crew, who used to call me Ralphie. And they would always tell me to be careful because I'm going to shoot my eye out with that thing. <laughs> From Jay DeWitt, are there more videos of Psy somewhere? Yes, in my imagination. And you're going to be seeing them on my channel. Colonel Angus, two months ago, can someone explain to me what's the big deal about an anvil? New to this channel and its contents. <laughs> All right, Colonel. <laughs> First of all, if you've got to ask that question, I don't know how in the world I can explain it to you, but it's something like this. An anvil is a tangible, heavy, substantial, permanent relic of a time in history that was simpler and harder, more strenuous, more demanding, more honest. They're rare. It's hard to find a hand-forged anvil. That makes them collectible, which in and of itself is compelling. They're supremely useful if you have any inclination or desire to ever blacksmith. You can't blacksmith without one. The useful component itself evokes a feeling of sort of vitality and necessity around owning something. It's something that you can clearly see in an earlier time was a must. It was a need. It was not a want. They're indestructible, virtually. They are, for the normal person, impossible to even consider making. It is iconic in shape. It evokes frontier, it evokes horsemanship, it evokes self-reliance. Right. An anvil is just a cool, cool thing. Get close to an anvil sometime. Ask somebody if you can heat up a piece of iron and lay it on there and hit it 
and then realize that everything civilization required comes to us, came to us, emerged from the interface between the face of an anvil, the face of a hammer, held in a set of tongs, wielded in a strong man's hand. And then tell me if you don't see what the compulsion to have an anvil consists of. That's it. Okay. Any other, like, frequently asked questions? Oh, I got a hot, hot yeah, iron. Yeah, I think we're good.